Uh, uh, hello everyone. Uh, okay. We will talk today about line shapes. Uh, well, I probably do not have to tell you that spectroscopy is really one of the very unique uh, diagnostics uh, tool, plasma diagnostics tools, because it allows for probing plasma uh, non-intrusively. Uh, non uh, well, in general, what is spectroscopy? Just looking for radiation that's coming from plasma. But you can look at that at a different levels. And you say just, OK, there is a light. And you say, OK, there is a plasma. Then you can look a bit in more detail, like using the toy uh, spectrometer Yuri uh, gave everybody to test on the first day of this uh, uh, school. And then you see there is a, some uh, a discrete spectrum, which already says you can uh, infer probably more or less uh, roughly the temperature, electron temperature of the plasma. Well, of course, uh, the chemical composition. Looking even at more details, you now start to, to, do, to, to see that this discrete spectrum actually consists of, 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 of many lines with each having its own width and shift. And that already may give you some information about plasma density. Looking even with more details, you no longer see the separate lines as a, just a, something which has only width and then shifted, but uh, there, there is a real line profile, uh, line shape. And line shape uh, gives you, uh, provided you have tools and you know how to calculate and interpret it, uh, line shape data, you can get a lot of more information about plasma, including uh, density uh, like it was before, but also uh, electromagnetic field, which could be just spontaneous fields like a plasma wave uh, that have been created in the plasma, but also uh, macroscopic uh, external fields. Uh, so what is a line shape? Uh, actually, it uh, tells you what is the probability to emit or to absorb a photon at a given uh, energy or wavelength. Uh, usually, uh, one uses normalized to unity uh, uh, line shape. Sometimes in some books you will see, and also you saw it in the previous lectures, that people sometimes define it with a, as a phi. I, I prefer to use a, a L to, to designate a normalized line shape, area normalized line shape. Uh, Howard already mentioned uh, yesterday that uh, absorption and, uh, and uh, emission line shapes are not necessarily the same. That's usually the case, but not always. That's just please keep it in mind. We will not use, uh, we will not uh, talk about this here because it's a rather advanced topic indeed, but one needs to, to keep it in mind in general. Uh, many uh, units you will see people use in, the, in different works. Uh, that's, that could be frequency, some use angular frequency, uh, wave number, which is just frequency over the speed of light and expressed in units of uh, inverse centimeters, uh, or in units of uh, uh, read bursts. Again, it could be expressed in uh, wave number units or in units of energy. People say call both values Rydberg. So strong, uh, strictly speaking, Rydberg is just uh, the energy unit. Uh, and finally, there is wavelength, which is the inverse value of the wave number. Uh, and for most of them, you can easily uh, convert one to another. For example, EV, uh, just multiplication by some number, fixed number, you, you can convert it to centimeters, inverse centimeters, or hertz, or angular, uh, or angular frequency. Uh, when you want to convert to uh, wavelengths, you have something different. You need to, to make, to calculate inverse of that value. 
usually people in line shapes talking about not absolute values of energies or, or, or frequencies, but only a deviation, which, for example, one, if one talks about width, right? And this values are usually much smaller than the value itself, that the unperturbed energy or unperturbed wavelength. And uh, for most of these uh, units and entities, the, the conversion is exactly the same, except for wavelengths, which now makes even more complex. And uh, you often see in literature expressions which involve something like delta lambda over lambda squared, which what I want to say is they are just unnecessary complex. In my view, they are also ugly. And uh, come on, uh, when uh, we, we, are, we all now know quantum mechanics, and in quantum mechanics there is no wavelength really, except for, uh, for de Broglie, okay? The experimentalists have always used wavelengths, Anstrom, or nanometers lately, because the, spec the spectrometer itself are based on the wave nature of the light. That's okay. They are based on interference or diffraction and all wave, uh, uh, on wave optics phenomena. But physics is really about energy, not about wavelengths. So uh, I will use only uh, energy or, or angular uh, frequency units. In atomic units, they are the same. Uh, and I actually urge you to always try to use, to work with uh, one of these good units and non n wavelengths, because especially when you are uh, talking about line broadening in plasma. <coughs> In plasma, <coughs> there are uh, several phenomena that affect uh, uh, line radiation. This is the motion of the radiator, which is the Doppler effect, and magnetic field, which uh, uh, gives rise to the uh, Zeeman uh, effect, Zeeman splitting. And finally, the electric field, uh, which is the, the, the reason for Stark effect. Uh, one can mention also natural broadening and some other types of, uh, of, uh, of, of natural decays, not only radiative like Auger. But in principle, I would say all this is due to the interaction with magnetic or electric fields of spontaneous radiation. So basically, it's just those three. OK, let's start uh, with the Doppler effect, it's the simplest one. And so instead of uh, original uh, energy or frequency, uh, the light is uh, an emitter emits, the, you, you detect, not, uh, detect the light the, which is shifted uh, by a constant value which is proportional to the velocity, to the projection of velocity towards the observer. Uh, so in plasma, there are, uh, huge number of particles, huge number of emitters, and each one uh, emits at a, uh, and each one has a different uh, velocity. So one, we need to, to, to go from a distribution uh, of uh, particle velocities, which is defined uh, by P of V, to the distribution of uh, frequencies or energies that you observe. So that's just a, uh, uh, trivial uh, uh, variable substitution, and you can get uh, the, the, line the line profile, which is expressed through uh, distribution of velocities. And the, the, the conversion factor here is the derivative of, uh, of uh, frequency sh shift with respect to velocity. And one needs to take the derivative as a point when the velocity Correspond, gives the, the, the frequency that one is interested here. Okay. Uh, so in case of thermal Doppler broadening, we well know what is the distribution of velocities, right? That's the Maxwellian. That's one dimensional in the projection of uh, along one axis. 
And so we immediately uh, convert one to another and get a uh, distribution of the probability of, uh, of, of observing photon at uh, given uh, energy. And uh, uh, well, of course, one immediately says that's uh, a Gaussian with a standard deviation expressed by that uh, formula. And uh, that's a convenient uh, uh, numerical expression when you use temperature in electron volts and mass in atomic mass units. Uh, and uh, you get uh, full width half max of, uh, of, of the line profile. Uh, interesting properties is that uh, the product of peak intensity on the full width half max is a value close to one. So, yes, please. The same, the same. Okay, full width of uh, half minimum. Uh, what about the, the absorption profile? There is no maximum. I mean, the maximum is zero. Okay, so you just invert it. As I said, in most situations, you can safely assume that absorption and, uh, and emission profiles are the same. So we'll talk here. When I say line profile, it's, it will be a line profile for emission, but it's just. You know it's the same, just invert it. <coughs> Good. Okay, just a few examples of, uh, of Gaussian profiles with different value of, uh, of uh, sigma of standard deviation parameter. And uh, well, uh, an uh, important uh, point here is that the winds of uh, Gaussian decay uh, decreases very fast. So, uh, so basically to in practical terms to zero so if the line profile is Gaussian uh, you can measure it in its entirety and and don't care about uh, far winds we will see that it's not always the case with other types of uh, line broadening <coughs> okay actually what the simple exercise that uh, we've done with uh, Doppler with thermal Doppler broadening is a good example of uh, what's called uh, quasi-static or statistical broadening. People usually do not use this term for Doppler, but in fact, it's exactly the same. So what we have done, there is a huge ensemble of different uh, emitters, or different radiators. Each one emits at a just single given frequency. It's a delta function as if we talk about its spectrum. But when we do averaging over a huge ensemble of independent or dependent radiators, we see uh, a, a, a continuous entity, which is the line shape. And that's not the result of line broadening that comes from a single emitter, single radiator that is broadened by some effect. It's just a pure mathema a mathematical uh, result of mathematical averaging, averaging over an ensemble. Well, here we did it, we, we converted from a probability to, to find a radiator with a given velocity. But in principle, it could, be, uh, it could be very similar when we consider uh, other effect which, which influences radiation of uh, energy of radiation of uh, one emitter. We will soon talk about stark broadening, in which case this, this uh, parameter uh, will be uh, electric field. <coughs> uh, so what are the distributions of uh, microfield in plasma? Obviously, in plasma we have a uh, large number of, of charged particles. And if we just sit at a one specific point or we consider one uh, just one pl plasma particle and uh, look at uh, different uh, at, at all other particles charged particles obviously there is a different probability to find a different uh, electric field each charged particles creates some field and we have an ensemble of such particles 
So at each given moment, uh, instant of time, there is a given, uh, there is some uh, probability to find uh, one specific electric field. For another uh, radiator, at the same time, there will be a different field because the, the combination of uh, its neighbors will be different. Uh, at first, uh, such a, a distribution uh, was derived by uh, uh, Johann Holzmark in 1919. Uh, and it's expressed that if one uh, neglects interaction between different uh, particles, the, it can be expressed in a nice, uh, in a nice uh, analytic form. Uh, one usually use not absolute value of the electric field, but normalize it to uh, to a constant, which is called the Holzmark normal field. If one forgets about this numerical uh, prefactor, the rest is pre actually obvious. If you find, if you want to 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 know what is the typical electric field, you need to know the typical distance to the to the perturber which is uh, density to the power minus third, right? That's the typical interparticle distance. And then what you see here is just Coulomb uh, law expressed in this unit. You have a, per, a charge of the perturber, uh, and you divide it over R squared. So it's just Coulomb law, and we get a typical electric field. The specific uh, numerical factor is uh, really not important. It comes from some mathematical considerations. So here I plot uh, this uh, Holzmark distribution okay, in, in units of this normalized uh, electric field strength. So you see that it peaks at about a uh, value a bit smaller than 2. Actually, it's 1.6 something. And uh, important to notice right now is the asymptotics of this distribution. For the uh, weak fields, it is quadratic. In the very strong fields, it's uh, it dependent is uh, the field in the power minus two and a half. Actually, this dependence is very easy. You can uh, just derive it in with uh, one line expression on the back of envelope. It just uh, uh, and assume just a single uh, perturber. It's in binary approximation. Again, it's just the Coulomb law. Just express. Uh, then uh, radius, uh, uh, distance to the uh, <coughs> back express distance from the field using the Coulomb law, and you immediately get uh, that asymptotics. OK, uh, two notes. Uh, one is, of course, there is nothing special about electric field. The, for gravitation, it's exactly the same Coulomb law. And the distribution of, uh, well, one doesn't say microfields in uh, Astrophysics, of course, but the distribution of gravitational fields by uh, random distribution of stars uh, follows exactly the same law. And uh, there is a very nice paper, uh, Chandrasekhar and von Neyman from uh, 42, which, uh, of course, they, 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 they quote Holzmark, but they continue this uh, to, to a, a much, uh, to, to, to quite great length. It's a very interesting paper, by the way. Uh, the fact that uh, it's the same uh, distribution for plasma microfields and astrophysical star fields, gravitational star fields, uh, is there is, uh, produces some confusion. Well, because first of all, Chandrasekhar and von Neumann are much more known to average physicists and especially not physicists than Holzmark. So I've had many times people, even in the plasma spectroscopy community, they're saying, oh, of course, but Holzmark first derived it for, 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 for gravitational fields. Okay. Not only that, I just uh, recently saw a, a large textbook, textbook. And in the introduction, it was written, there was a sentence, something like that, in 1919, uh, famous Danish uh, astronomer discovered distribution of gravitational fields. It's, dex it's a textbook. So uh, there are three mistakes in one sentence. He is not Danish. He is Norwegian. He is not astronomer. He is plasma physicist. And not gravitational fields, he considered but plasma fields. 
By the way, Holzmark was a postdoc of uh, Peter Debye, so good school. Okay, uh, let's talk a bit about uh, Stark effect, uh, about static Stark effect. Uh, we'll consider a simplest uh, two-level system that you all learned in the introductory course of, uh, of quantum mechanics, and uh, actually, you must know all this, of course, by heart, but le le let me repeat to, to show you that there is nothing uh, uh, very difficult here. So the perturbation due to the electric field is just the dipole uh, electric moment times uh, electric field, right? We will assume the field which is directed, say, along the z-direction. Uh, so in the two-level Hamiltonian, that, of course, uh, will be a of diagonal terms because uh, dipole, because of symmetry, uh, uh, symmetry uh, properties cannot be, uh, must be zero between the same, uh, the diagonal element between the same wave functions. Okay, so it's only of diagonal terms. Now we add the unperturbed Hamiltonian, which is just diagonal unperturbed values of energies E1 and E2, both zero, uh, labeled zero. Now we want to find eigenvalues, so we demand the determinant of H Hamiltonian minus E is zero, and we immediately find that it's a simple uh, quadratic uh, equation, roots of the quadratic equations, like that. Uh, I've plotted the dependence of uh, energies of both E1 and E2 levels as a function of uh, electric field normalized to, to some value the obvious value, right? You will see it here. <coughs> uh, asymptotics. When the field, in the weak field limit, when the field is much smaller than the initial, the, when the perturbation is much smaller than the initial split, splitting between the levels, for whatever reason it is there, uh, the effect is uh, quadratic. Uh, in the strong field limit, when the perturbation is much stronger than the initial splitting, the effect be becomes linear. And you see it's here, and I plotted uh, asymptotics both for the weak field, that's uh, the parabola, and the asymptotics for the strong field limit, which are just the straight lines. <coughs> In general, uh, so when people say that this level or this line has a quadratic or linear stark effect, one should understand that's always a question of how strong a field is, because in principle there are no fully degenerate levels. There is, there is always some uh, distance between the levels, at least between the levels that talk to each other via dipole, electric dipole interaction, right? Even if you consider the simplest uh, hydrogen, neutral hydrogen, one say, okay, all levels with principal quantum numbers have the same energy, but we know if you take into account relativistic effects, so you get fine structure and there is a already splitting between uh, levels. Then, okay, even in that uh, approximation to S, say one half and to P one half have the same energy, but then quantum electrodynamics corrections uh, gives you the, the, the lamp shift. So in, uh, uh, in practice, there, is, there are no fully uh, degenerate uh, atomic systems. Uh, so uh, it is always a question how strong a field is, whether you can talk about quadratic or linear effects. That should be kept in mind. By the way, uh, when, you say, when one says linear effect, it's also not exactly true because, uh, well, you, you can continue uh, uh, expanding this expression in Taylor series, and you will see that will be only even powers of, uh, of electric field. There is no linear, truly linear term, okay? Okay, uh, that's a, a stark effect of the simplest uh, atomic transition, which is Lyman alpha, that's transition from n equal two to n equal one in hydrogen or hydrogen-like uh, atom, like ion. So the static Stark effect is just a splitting when you have uh, uh, three components. 
Now we will talk, assuming the effect is linear, that's neglecting all fine structure and uh, lamp shifts and whatever, okay? Uh, so there are three components, the central component and there are side components which are split, shifted proportional to the electric field. So that the static picture have three components. Now, uh, when there is a distribution of, uh, of electric field, like a micro field distribution in plasma, uh, instead of uh, one single position, which is uh, in terms of line profile, it's a delta function. Now we have a distribution of such a infinite number of delta functions, but practically what we see, of course, is just a smooth uh, wing, both wings, red and, and blue wing. Okay, the central component remains in this simple approximation unshifted, which is of course not true, but that's okay to, to demonstrate uh, how the quasi-static broadening works. Uh, we next want to, to consider time-dependent perturbation. Uh, in general, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, phenomena we are talking about, if something changes in time, one can define what's called spectrum, uh, power spectrum of this entity. Okay, for that, if there is some entity of physical quantity evolving with time, one takes Fourier transform at it, takes absolute value, raises to the second power, and that's a power spectrum. Okay, so I just wrote, hit, uh, wrote here implicitly Fourier transform. Uh, in the case of dipole radiation, the electric field, as you, of course, know, is proportional to the dipole moment of a uh, radiator. That's true also in classical mechanics and uh, quantum uh, mechanics, quantum electrodynamics as well, okay? So we do not want to, 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 to take with us all the numerical proportionality coefficients. Let's just focus on the, the main important proportionality. So the electric field, as absorbed by some distant observer is proportional to the dipole, uh, electric dipole moment of the radiator, okay? So uh, we are following just this prescription. Now the dipole is uh, oscillating, uh, okay? Because uh, that's the in, um, well, that's omega is just the energy difference between the uh, initial and final state. Uh, let's consider natural broadening. So we have a radiative decay from state I to state F, and the characteristic time, of course, is the Einstein coefficient. If we neglect, uh, we, we, we do not consider uh, induced radiation. Uh, decay rate is just the inverse of the Einstein coefficient. Sorry, it's proportional, of course. <coughs> uh, proportional. Uh, so when we say a uh, state decays with the rate uh, gamma, it means that the wave function, which describes the upper uh, state, absolute value squared, uh, is decaying like uh, exponent to the minus uh, gamma t, which means the wave function itself must follow uh, that uh, time dependence. <coughs> And we can uh, neglect the any time dependence of the ground state, assuming it's ground uh, of the lower state, assuming it's a ground state. Uh, so uh, that can be written as uh, the wave function of the of the uh, upper uh, state. Uh, and I introduced here what's called heavy side unit step function. That means that for time before zero. It is constant, and it radiates somehow. No, nothing prevents it to, to radiate, and then we start to decay. So taking the Fourier transform of this expression is just a simple uh, exercise. You get that. Now we are taking uh, absolute value squared, and what we see up to a, a constant a Lorentzian uh, line shape, right? If there are, by the way, some questions, just ask right in the middle. Don't, don't wait until the end of the two hours. Okay, some examples of Lorentzians with different uh, 
uh, of standard deviations. Uh, contrary to Gaussian's uh, profile that we saw before, uh, Lorentzian has a very long uh, tails, long wings. Okay. Uh, there could be uh, the often a situation when a line is broadened by different mechanism. One is uh, has a Lorentzian line shape and another Gaussian, for example. Lorentzian could be natural line shape and a natural broadening, and there is a Doppler broadening. And one needs to do is convolve both line shapes, assuming they are independent, of course. So the convolution of uh, Lorentzian and Gaussian is uh, is what's called the void profile, void distribution, void function. Uh, let me first show you some examples. Uh, so there are, uh, actually, the, both Lorentzian and Gaussian is uh, extreme limiting cases of void profile. Uh, for example, here, uh, sigma, that's uh, Gaussian part, is 1, and Lorentzian broadening is 0. You have just a normal uh, Gaussian. In the opposite case, there is no Gaussian contribution, only Lorentzian. We have, well, we have Lorentzian. And that's a convolution, example of convolution when both contribute, let's say, equally. And uh, of course, you have a, a, a broader profile. Uh, important point here that the wings are Lorentzian wings. So uh, Gaussian broadening contributes to extra broadening in the core of the line, but the wings remains the same as they were just due to the whatever phenomenon that caused Lorentzian line shape. Okay, let's go back. Uh, and that uh, for practical terms, there is a, a convenient expression when you know the contribution, the Gaussian and Lorentzian contributions. So full width half max of each one to get a full width half max of the total void profile. Just use this simple expression, and you get with pretty good ex accuracy, typically about 1%, 2%. OK. Uh, now we want to do some uh, more uh, mathematical exercise, but I promise to it be uh, quite straightforward. And, and, and again, please, uh, now this is something which you will see if you ever want to see some theoretical work. You will see the expressions that we will derive in the end of five minutes, I guess. So please, if something is not clear, just ask right now. Uh, I think it's for, it, it is important to, to, to understand. It's simple stuff, but, but, but in, even in, in textbooks, sometimes people just start from the final expression because it was derived you know, 50 years ago in some another textbook or paper, and then continue on. And you don't really understand what are the roots of this equation number one. OK, so that's we saw. If we want to, 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 to calculate uh, intensity, line shape of a dipole, we, we will talk for now only about dipole uh, emission, dipole radiation. So we take uh, dipole momentum, take Fourier transform of it at a frequency omega, that's the same omega, absolute value squared. Nice. And that's, uh, again, Fourier transform. OK, now we can use uh, cross correlation theorem that. Uh, I believe you, you've heard about it and learned and maybe even proved it on a, some exam. Uh, so what it says uh, that a product of Fourier transforms of two functions is up to a normalization factor, which is different for different, uh, by the way, for different Fourier transforms. Some put here 1 over square root of 2 pi. Let's forget about this fine uh, unnecessary details. So again, the product of two Fourier transforms of two functions is just Fourier transform of product, of, 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 of a convolution of this function, OK? So we can express this value, uh, Fourier transform of, uh, of uh, our dipole function, OK? In our case, by the way, bo both f and g are the same. So instead of correlation, we are talking about autocorrelation. Uh, OK, so c is just the correlation function, right? That's, uh, 
there's a definition of convolution of two functions. That's exactly the definition of convolution or correlation up to a minus sign. Uh, OK, so f in my case and g in my case are the same d as a function of time. So that's just uh, autocorrelation function. And if I take its Fourier transform according to this cross-correlation theorem, I must get a Fourier transform of if the same function squared. That's exactly what I want. Is it OK at this point? I can repeat it and explain with more details. If it's OK, let's go on. Uh, of course, the uh, correlation, autocorrelation function is symmetric. So instead of uh, just taking integral from minus infinity to plus, I can do it from 0 to plus infinity and take only the real part. OK? That should be OK. Well, next, that was for a single radiator. But plasma, as we know, contains a practically infinite number of radiators, so we will need to average our ensemble of plasma radiators. So we, let's designate it by this uh, average symbol. And of course, averaging, uh, taking averaging or integral are uh, commuting operations. So I move this averaging stuff inside of the integral, and I want just to average the, the correlation, after correlation function over the same ensemble. Now, if you actually look at what is the uh, autocorrelation function, that's this integral. But integral is basically a sum, infinite sum of pairs like that. Now, one can say, why do I need to do this operation twice? Uh, if we believe in the ergodicity argument that the time average is equal to ensemble average, we can substitute time average with the ensemble average, or vice versa. Uh, that's actually a very important point. Uh, but it should be quite simple. Let's say we want to, to do some statistical experiment. What is the probability, what is the distribution of uh, getting different values when you throw dice? Okay. Let's do the experiment. I can give each of you one dice, and each of you will throw it up and get some value. Then we can combine and calculate average, standard deviation, or whatever other statistical property. Alternatively, I may pick up just one person out, for example, Yuri Ralchenko, who is not listening to me, give him uh, uh, the same one dice, and ask to do it. We are now 60 people about here, so to, to do this, this operation 60 times, and again, write down and do the same average and standard deviation. And of course, we will get the same, well, within statistical uh, errors, the same result. Well, that's the error could be significant when we are talking about 60 people, but when we are talking about billions of atoms in an even small amount of plasma, that's the averaging on time and averaging on uh, ensemble should be exactly the same. So. Uh, what I say that in this infinite sum, if I talk, let's take just one, uh, uh, one term. For example, tau is equal 1 million. And consider a correlation term for, for t equal 2, whatever units. So what is the, this term for one radiator? So correlation between time equal 1 million and 1 million and 2. I claim that I can find on the same term in the similar summation when I will do on some another radiator. It will not be at t equal tau equal million. It will be tau equal whatever other numbers. But when I have infinite number of radiators to play with, I'm sure I will find another one which gives for the same difference tau and tau plus t will give exactly the same result. That's just statistics. OK, so if so, why do I need to take with me all this infinite sum? Let's restrict myself to just one single value of, of tau. And let's take tau equals 0. Why not? So 
I can write if I do the average. I can do it average over just a single term in this infinite sum or in this uh, integral, right? So it's a uh, uh, dipole moment at time zero times dipole moment at time t, and I am going to, of course, average over ensemble of infinite ensemble of uh, statistically representative ensemble of, of emitters. Okay, so next, as you remember, once we have uh, the autocorrelation function, we, need, we, we take its Fourier transform, and that's all. The, the line intensity. That's the, the, the line profile. Okay? Very good. Uh, so uh, we've done, up to now, we considered just a single dipole, but uh, in principle, of course, one atom can radiate at different frequencies. There are different transitions. So instead of talking about dipole, uh, just dipole momentum, once talk about uh, operator of the dipole momentum, but the rest is exactly the same. In addition, we need to take into account probable uh, uh, distribution of uh, population on different states of the radiator. For example, it could be Boltzmannian, but it could be any, of course. So that's the density matrix row. So we multiply everything and take trace because we have all many possible transition even in single atom and that's again the same uh, uh, autocorrelation function. Uh, an important note here is that you sometimes, I would say even often, see in the literature, line shape broadening literature, expression like that. When you, the autocorrelation function is just this term without the important averaging over ensemble. So, uh, of course, in textbook, even in textbooks sometimes, but in papers, when people write it, they, they understand what they are doing. They assume that it is all is done in the context of averaging over an ensemble afterwards. But it's not always clear for uh, newcomers, let's say, to the field. So please pay attention. Because obviously, such an expression is invalid. Uh, because w w w what's that? It's just, it's a constant, and that's some function, in principle, arbitrary function. So when you take Fourier transform of an arbitrary function, you can get anything, including negative values, which is, of course, a nonsense for line profile. But of course, when you take this, uh, line profile which contains negative value and do averaging over ensemble. There is no negative values anymore, but please keep that important point in mind. Uh, another note uh, is uh, that sometimes this autocorrelation, this dipole-dipole autocorrelation function is called uh, autocorrelation function of the light amplitude or light magnitude. And in fact, I believe that's a more correct uh, name for this value because the transition is not necessarily dipole. We can consider, we can use exactly the same derivation for, for example, quadrupole uh, radiation, in which case, of course, there will be no dipole-dipole autocorrelation function. There will be quadrupole-quadrupole or whatever autocorrelation function. But uh, in terms of, of light, of light magnitude, amplitude, uh, it's the same. So. I, I believe physically it's more correct uh, way to, to call it. Okay. <coughs> so uh, that's the final expression of the formal theory of line broadening. And it looks very simple, right? But as it's always in the case in physics, uh, the simplest equations uh, are most difficult to, to solve. So what we see here is time evolution of uh, dipole momentum. We are still talking about uh, dipole radiation, okay? And we have uh, density matrix, and we have uh, operation over, over of uh, averaging over an uh, ensemble. And all of these three simple operations are actually infinitely uh, complex. Why? Because plasma is uh, basically is dynamics, uh, time evolution of uh, its n body where, where n goes to infinity. 
number of interacting particles, each one may serve both as a perturber and as an emitter. Okay, and all interact on each other. There is also back reaction from from uh, radiator to the bus, uh, which is uh, the rest of the plasma particles, because there is no rest. All, all particles, both uh, perturber and radiator in general. Okay, uh, so in the remaining uh, few minutes till the break, I want to show you some movie. Uh, well, this is the result of uh, computer simulation of uh, uh, molecular dynamics of plasma particles, okay. Uh, what you see in this short movie is a life of plasma during just one picosecond. Uh, I'm plotting here projection of, uh, of uh, electric field onto some arbitrarily selected axis. Uh, well, the color, the, the color designates, uh, color designates uh, uh, absolute value of the oh, uh, direction of the projection and the intensity of the color is the, the magnitude of the field. Okay, and that's it. we are taking just very small uh, volume inside of plasma. So you see, by the way, it looks like something uh, live, like biological uh, stuff. <laughs> now, now we see why, 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 why plasma in physics is called after plasma, the, bl the blood plasma, okay? It, it, it looks like that. <coughs> so you see here uh, the results of motion of different particles. And some are obviously are very slow, for example, here, right? It's almost not moving, but if you wait long enough, you will see that slowly it does move and the field changes. So these slow points are, of course, ions, and the fast moving stuff are fields due to electrons. So I, I guess you realize that's quite a complex dynamics with very complex interaction between different plasma particles. So. Uh, Coming back to this simple expression, so coming back to this simple expression, which is the basically the des describes the line broadening is uh, not easy, okay? So we will continue after the break. <laughs>